Now, please welcome Jeffrey Rosen, President and CEO of the National Constitution Center, and Raihan Salam, the executive editor of The National Review. They're here with Atlantic contributing editor, Alex Wagner. <laughs> Are we all gonna just do calisthenics now? I think maybe that would make us all feel good or better about the state of our democracy if we just didn't talk about it and just did the hokey pokey. <laughs> um, thank you, gee whiz. Um, I, we sit in Washington, D.C. At, at the precipice of what feels like a huge moment uh, for our democracy. And it also feels like the ties that bind us together in this project we call the United States are fraying. So let me just begin this conversation with a big question to both of you guys. Have we devolved hopelessly into factionalism or is there a light at the end of the tunnel? So the piece in the issue of The Atlantic argues that... That you wrote. That I wrote, <laughs> at Jeff Goldberg's suggestion, because he asked me what would Madison have made of American democracy today? That was the impetus for this special issue. And it was a really important question, and I tried to answer it. And the answer is not an optimistic one. It says that we're living in a Madisonian dystopia. Madison's central concern when he came to Philadelphia in 1787 was fears of demagogues and the mob. He had been reading about the history of failed democracies like Greece and Rome, which had elevated demagogues like Cleon, who seduced the 6,000 person Athenian assembly. And Madison said, I've recited this this morning as a party trick, so I, I can't usually uh, recite the Federalist Papers, but here we go. <laughs> Federalist 55, in all very large assemblies of any number conceived, passion never fails to wrest the scepter from reason. Even if every Athenian had been Socrates, Athens would still have been a mob. So Madison's central problem is mobs, which he defined as a majority or a minority animated by reason, by passion rather than reason, devoted to private interest rather than the public good. His solution is a representative republic where wise representatives filter populist passions. He thinks the large size of America will make it hard for mobs to discover each other and mobilize. And he sets up a series of cooling mechanisms to prevent passion from triumphing and to allow reason majorities to prevail. And they include checks and balances, separation of powers, federalism, the electoral college, the indirect election of senators. All of the mechanisms that he put in place are now under siege for reasons we can talk about, and then we've got another 10 minutes and we can <laughs> solve this problem. <laughs> well, and it, let, let's talk about how uh, some of the diagnoses you make, uh, Jeff, the polarization in Congress, Raihan. We are now looking, I mean, the, this is an interesting week to talk about it because earlier today we heard from Jeff Flake and Chris Coons who are working in a bipartisan fashion for the moment on the Brett Kavanaugh nomination. Do you think the country is truly hungry for more bipartisanship or tribalism is the order of the day? Well, I do believe that when you're looking at rank and file voters, they are choosing between parties that are themselves highly polarized, not necessarily because that reflects the sensibilities of voters at large, but rather because there are all kinds of dynamics that have, that have gotten us to that, uh, to that impasse. So when you're thinking about the actual complexity of public opinion and the extent to which that complexity is not being conveyed in our legislative institutions, is not reflected among our lawmakers, you have to start thinking about institutional change. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a sociologist, Andreas Wimmer, who's written, uh, written this really fascinating work on looking at divided societies. Um, and the fact that in many societies, the reason why you don't have a lot of uh, national solidarity, a lot of allegiance to shared symbols, is because there are many people who feel disenfranchised, they feel marginalized, they feel excluded. And I see this very clearly in our electoral politics. Uh, when you think about New York City, New York City is a place that we think of as monolithically left of center. In fact, New York City is home to many right of center voters, but the nature of our electoral institutions is such that they are not reflected in the legislature. They're not reflected in our debates. Similarly, there are many rural areas that are overwhelmingly represented by, you know, let's say right of center lawmakers, yet there are actually many left of center people in those constituencies. So when you think about a political system that would actually properly reflect those differences, 
And when you think about the fact that some of our diversity, some of our ethnic and cultural diversity, is now not in hyper-segregated enclaves, but rather distributed across the map, there is a serious problem of the lack of representation of these kind of distinctive constituencies that could play a kind of bridge-building role in our mm -hmm. politics if we actually opened ourselves up to representing them. We're at a moment, and you talk about this in the article, Jeff, where passions have been inflamed. And in fact, politicians directly appeal to those passions. What is the way out of that when passions drive media coverage, they drive campaign sloganeering, they drive votes in a lot of in races? How, how, what is the path forward beyond this highly emotional, deeply charged American politic? The path forward has to be institutional and technological. So the fact that institutions are under siege as never before is a crisis. This morning, it was incredibly dramatic to hear Jeff Flake and Chris Kuhn say that the institutional legitimacy of the Senate and the Supreme Court have never been more under siege. And that is reflected by the polarization of Congress, where both sides don't talk to each other, by tweeting presidents who communicate directly with the people, a Madisonian nightmare, by a court which is dividing cases by five to four Republican and Democratic votes, and most importantly by social media, which has sped up deliberation so quickly that passion can't cool and we don't have time for reasoned majorities to prevail. The most striking datum is that fake news travels more quickly and more widely than real news because people are more likely to share stuff with inflammatory opinions. So one modest technological fix is that Facebook, which has started up a new commission on this question, could prioritize on the news feed stuff that people actually read. It's creepy that you know what we read, but it's right. good that they only allow people to see first what is actually read. But that's a very modest solution. What we centrally need are re-legitimizing the cooling mechanisms and allowing them to do their jobs. Rehan and I began to talk about this. I'll put it on the table, and Rehan's further thoughts are good. The Senate was conceived as a fully equal body to the president that would make its own independent constitutional judgments and would use its subpoena power and investigatory power to form conclusions. So, uh, and ben, Senator Ben Sass has been talking about this, as has Senator Coons. There's no reason to delegate to the FBI, say, an investigation. The Senate can do it on itself. And the Senate and the President are supposed to, before voting on bills, make judgments about their constitutionality. It's the most amazing thing to read 19th century debates before the Civil War and to see uh, Clay and Webster uh, talking in constitutional terms about whether the Missouri Compromise or the Compromise of 1850 should be passed. And, and I should say also, uh, Kuhn, uh, Senators Coons and Mike Lee are the chair of a commission that the Constitution Center has set up called a Madisonian Constitution for All, asking the question you are, how can we resurrect Madisonian values? And Coons, uh, Senator Coons said this morning that he's committed to trying having to have a constitutional debate on the floor of the Senate, uh, hopefully with Senator Lee, about, for example, a question like the constitutionality of the in Independent Counsel mm -hmm. Act, which is a qu question about which there are good constitutional arguments on both sides. So I think that taking things out of the partisan arena, having the Senate debate things in constitutional terms, reinstating things like regular order, which slow things down rather than allowing party line votes, and other institutional changes would achieve the main goal, which is just to slow down deliberation so that reason rather than passion can do, Raihan, do you feel like this moment in the Senate, since it is supposed to be the, the cooling saucer, I believe, right? George Washington. <laughs> uh, possible, but... Is this moment exemplary of the Senate being the cooling saucer, or is it the very opposite, that passions are inflamed in even the Senate, so it no longer is performing its cooling function? How well, do you see this, this present moment? You and Jeff have both thought very deeply about these institutional questions. My own view is that there are things happening in the country. There is class and ethnic stratification. These developments are real, and uh, you know our politicians, they're responding to them in some ways. Uh, and that's why you know I've written this book, Melting Pot or Civil War. And the argument is that when you think about our current stratification, our current divides, you referenced tribalism before. Mm -hmm. I fear that this is likely to get much worse in the coming years rather than better. And I do believe that eventually that will be reflected in our politics. You already see it reflected to some extent. Wait, what but do you I don't mean much it. worse? Well, look. No, li it, literally. It, it's, it's very straightforward. When you think about a country like ours, when you do not have some kind of unifying national narrative, when you have 
millions of young people who feel as though they are locked out of the American dream, they are being incorporated into marginalized minorities that are not being represented. You know, we talk about one kind of populism, that's the populism of the heartland, that's the populism of older Americans. Largely white populism. Right. I believe that there's going to be another populism that's going to represent folks who belong to those marginalized minorities that are growing over time. And I believe that if we don't change our political institutions, if we don't rethink our immigration policy, our safety net, and much else to meet this challenge of investing in this next generation, I think that, honestly, today's politics will look like tiddlywinks. We are going to have a much more rancorous politics in the years to come. Well, is it rancorous or does nothing ever get done and the power of the federal government is greatly diminished and it really is a very localized, state-focused governance that we have? Nothing getting done could be a great thing. <laughs> this, uh, you know, this was the position of the Jeffersonians and the Madisonians, and it used to be the Democratic Party, and now it's the more libertarian strain of the Republican Party. But the fact that uh, all three branches have to agree before anything can get done is good in uh, the Madisonian system. States' rights and federalism also are being rediscovered by progressives. Dean Heather Gerken of Yale Law School talks about Look at the how state of California. Absolutely. I mean, they can't secede. We've got the, Civil War, the Civil War settled that. that uh, you're well, they can try again, I guess. Well, and the president <laughs> can send out the troops and say that Lincoln said right. you needed a majority of the people of the United States to, uh, uh, to change the nature of the union. But the fact that uh, everything from marriage equality to uh, gun rights bubbled up at the state level is a sign of Madisonian health. But I really, Rayhan just made, Rayhan just made a very serious point that the question is, are the institutions going to fail us or by resurrecting them, could we prevent the worst tribalism that he's talking about? Just to put it on the table, what about the proposition that what we, I, I, this is Madisonian, although not uh, popular, what we need is less direct democracy, more filtered democracy. Majorities should prevail always, but you have to jump through a lot of hoops before they're allowed to do that. Would that solve the problem? So you're talking about like re-empowering the Electoral College. No, the Electoral College is clearly a disaster. It's not serving the purposes that it was meant right. to. Right, although, but, uh, although, I mean, in, in your piece for The Atlantic, you make the point that, that the, the power of the Electoral College was one of the predicates of, of sort of like the cooling of, of our democracy. It was originally conceived as a group of Solons, of sage people, i.e. propertied white men, who would know the candidates of the highest character and best discernment and would second guess the populist passions of the people by choosing the best uh, men. That is not going to fly today, and it shouldn't fly in a democratic age, in an age that's not deferential to elites. There's no way we could re resurrect that kind of substitute. But just making people think twice or three times before they can make decisions is important. That was the whole point, the beauty of this Flake Coons moment. And maybe, Raihan, you're right, it's just a brief week and then we'll go back to the abyss. But at least people had to think and talk and collect facts. And that breathing space, that cooling mechanism by itself is a model for what might be our salvation. Well, one serious concern when you think about federalism, for example, why is it that in national politics we constantly discuss issues that ordinarily are handled at the state and local level. The reason is that when you look at how people think about their party affiliations, the issues at the state and local level might be markedly different than the issues at the national level, but people use their national party allegiances to make decisions at the state and local level. Most of us, including people in this room, awfully sophisticated, well-informed people, do not know, you know, who is your state assemblyman? Yeah. Who is your state senator and what have you? What are the actual issues at stake at that level? Our politics have become nationalized in a way that's made our political conversation very brittle. Well, why, why do you think that is? Uh, why don't people know who their local representatives I think are. that it's structural. I think that there's just a tendency to think, okay, you know, we are thinking about this issue, public education is important, therefore it is a national issue, therefore if I'm a national candidate, I must talk about it, I must address it. And I think that in that case, actually making things a bit more democratic by, for example, empowering governors, who are figures who do from time to time transcend partisan affiliation, they're able to broker compromises in ways that you don't see at lower levels of the government, but we do have to think about the fact that in this environment, uh, you need to work with the grain of public opinion in some ways, and how that works, how it's formed rather than against it. It's really interesting. Madison thought states were the danger because they were the mobs. Shays Rebellion, debtors against creditors. At the national level, you'd have the thoughtful people. Now it's the opposite. The national dramas are 
uh, so, more, so much more salient than the more uh, uh, local stuff that people are focusing entirely on them, whereas at the local level, and state politicians confirm this, there's more opportunity for a compromise. People have real problems, uh, and they have less need to dig in their heels. There's a great new book out by Judge Jeffrey Sutton called 50 Constitutions, and it is so interesting to learn from Judge Sutton how if you're a progressive and you think you're now gonna lose at the Supreme Court level, turn to the states because they have robust privacy protections and uh, uh, economic equality protections, all of which you can argue. And if you're a conservative, you're one too. And just by turning down the heat to have the Supreme Court hear fewer cases and decide things at a local level, is one immediate solution. Can I po posit another theory, which is it's harder to hate your neighbor and it's easier to hate the faceless red state Republican or the faceless, faceless blue state liberal, right? I mean, it's easier to be empathetic and to be collaborative among those people with whom you live at the state and local level. Is that maybe, I mean, is basic human nature at play when we talk about political investment and tribalism? I would hope that's true. One concern, however, is that we have these incredibly powerful technological tools right. that allow us, even in the context of our local communities, our neighborhoods, uh, to withdraw from that world of immediate relationships, relationships that you might not bother to invest in and form, versus these larger identities that are more abstract and that oftentimes are governed by passion. Um, so true. So technology is the antithesis of the face-to-face -face discussion, which, as Coons and Lee said this morning, is the key to bipartisanship. The fact that they worked out together and traveled together and were on this weird reality show, You've Got to Die <laughs> challenge together, made them <laughs> friends. And now that Chris Coons said senators are off campaigning and dialing for dollars, they can't empathize with each other. And state representatives, I've talked to have said they can generally empathize when they're able to, but once you start tweeting in the middle of deliberations to appeal to your base, then both sides dig in their heels and compromise is impossible. So those two things, face-to-face -face deliberation and privacy, turned out to be key to the Constitutional Convention. Yeah and might be key to saving our politics today. He also talked about working out together in the Senate gym, so yeah. circling back full, fully yes. to our calisthenics that started this conversation, maybe the answer is just cardio. We have to leave it there. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs>